A very good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Welcome to the Five Star Club Med or Club Meditation in Mahindrama. It is our honor and privilege to have a superstar teacher, Ajahn Brahmavamso, here, or more popularly known as Ajahn Brahm, to guide us in this retreat as well as to share with us the Dharma talk for tonight. Ajahn Brahm was born in London in 1951 and he graduated with a first class honours in physics from the Cambridge University. In 1974, he travelled to Thailand to ordain as a Buddhist monk and Ajahn was trained under the famous meditator Ajahn Chah in northeast Thailand. In 1983, Ajahn moved to the newly established Bodhiyana Monastery in Perth where he eventually assumed the position of abbot of the monastery in 1995. Venerable Ajahn is also the spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. Today, after being ordained as a monk for more than 11,500 days, that's approximately 32 years, Ajahn is now one of the most sought after Dharma teachers and speaker in the globe. Therefore, we call him a superstar Ajahn. Recently, Ajahn was bestowed the title Chao Kun Pravisudi Samara Tera by the King of Thailand in the beginning of 2006. Tonight, Ajahn will enlighten us with another interesting topic. And tonight's topic will be on how to be a Buddhist and succeed in business. Okay, so the topic of tonight's talk is to teach you how to be rich. <laughs> and sometimes people might think, what is a Buddhist monk doing teaching people how to be rich? The point is that as Buddhism grows in this world, it has an amazing amount of wonderful psychology, teaching, encouragement and wisdom, which is applied in all areas of our life. Which is why that in this series of three talks which I've been giving here in Penang over this period, that I've chosen subjects which aren't to do with theoretical Buddhism, nor about the religion itself, but how that religion is applied in one's daily life. Now first I talked about marriage and love, and then yesterday about science, and today about business. And my qualification for teaching you about business is that you may know that the oldest multinational corporation in the world is the Sangha. The <laughs> community of Buddhist monks and nuns, which was founded in 2,500 years ago, which has been spread throughout the world, and it is certainly the oldest multinational corporation in the world. Moreover, that I am the CEO, I am the uh, regional manager of our Australian operation <laughs> with franchises in Singapore and maybe a franchise in Malaysia with the group here, who knows. But certainly that I have branches in many countries and because of that, that I do have to learn about some management skills, but not only that, because of the nature of my training, learning of meditation, studying these teachings of the Buddha and applying them to our modern world, you do find some strategies which are incredibly meaningful and powerful. So much so, that you may be surprised and pleased to learn that one of the things which I'm going to get up to next year is to teach a master class at a conference in London, not a Buddhist conference, but a business conference. Because last May, some of my disciples in Singapore sent my book, Open the Door of Your Heart, to the Human Resources uh, Institute, the Singapore Human Resources Institute. And the people who were running that were so impressed. They invited me to give a small class in the May Human Resources and Development Conference in Singapore. It was only a small class, but I was the only Buddhist monk there, the only religious people amongst all these people in these very flash suits. 
and his expensive hairstyle. My hairstyle is not very expensive at all. <laughs> and there I, I rolled up to this conference and gave a talk. And afterwards, quite a few people were very impressed. And there's one fellow, I didn't really know who he was, he said, this was worth coming all the way from London for, just to hear me speak. And some of the other people from Brazil said, all those other speakers, you can read about that in books, but what they heard from me, that was really impressive. And I forgot about that until a few weeks later, I got an email via our secretary inviting me to give a bigger speech at a bigger conference, a 2007 International Human Resources and Development Conference in the Exco Convention Centre on the banks of the Thames in the heart of London. What they're doing is they're paying all my expenses so I can teach CEOs and vice presidents throughout Europe how to run their companies. And that's why I was delighted to accept, not only my mother lives in London so I can go and see her, but also just the idea of taking these Buddhist teachings to an important part of our modern world, the boardrooms, because so many decisions which affect people's lives are made in these quiet little rooms in the top of office towers throughout our world. And these are decisions which not only affect our environment, but our hip pocket, affect our families, our economies, and so much of our life depends on these economies. And so, as a Buddhist monk, I'm going to be of great assistance, not just to your meditation, not to your heart, but also to your bank balance. <laughs> Interested? So, how, why was I invited to such a conference and what has Buddhism got to say about modern business? It has a huge amount to say. And what it has to say is that in modern business there is so competitive that you do need an edge to succeed. You can't just expect to go the old ways and just to keep on going. Too many companies and small businesses, they go under. And why do they go under? There's not enough balance, enough drive, enough edge, enough innovation to keep on going. Now look at, again, going back to my business. It's the monk business, not monkey business, the monk business. Keep the E out of this. In the monk business you can see that even though I come from probably the strictest tradition in Theravada, the Thai Theravada um, forest tradition, still when I go to Australia, when I go to the West, you have to innovate, you have to find out what the customers want. So I think I've learned what the customers in Penang want, which is why I get so many clients coming on, a <laughs> on an evening in Mahindarama temple. So you have to adjust your product to the people who are listening. So you've got this amazing product called Buddhism or Dhamma. And so you've got to sort of adjust it, change it, to make it interesting, to make it meaningful, so the customers come. Like one example of that is how I've adapted, but not altered, some of these teachings of Buddhism. Those of you who went to the Dharma school when you were a child, you hear the basic teaching of Buddhism is what? Four Noble Truths. And what does that start with? Suffering. And lots of people told me, when they first go to a Buddhist temple or a Buddhist talk, they hear the word suffering and then they head for the door. They've got enough suffering in life. They've got a wife, <laughs> they've got a husband, <laughs> and they've got debts, Oh, there's too much suffering in life already. What do they want to learn about that for? And so a lot of times, as you know in business, the first impressions are the most important. So you don't start Four Noble Truths with suffering. Years and years ago I saw through this in the West, and so I teach Third Noble Truth first. The Third Noble Truth is the end of suffering, otherwise known as happiness. And any person who knows their Dhamma, knows Buddhism, knows the Buddha actually said the third noble truth, the end of suffering, the ultimate happiness, that's Nirvana, that's what we go for. 
So we start with happiness. So when I give talks on traditional Buddhism, I say, happiness is the first truth. And people get interested. And the cause of happiness. Do you want to be happy? Yeah. And why are we sometimes unhappy? That's the first noble truth and the cause of that unhappiness. So that's my Four Noble Truths. Exactly the same as the Buddhist Four Noble Truths, but changed, repackaged, marketed for the interest of the people. So of course that's been very, very successful. That's why I'm so busy. <laughs> so my company is expanding. It's taking on new recruits, new monks and new nuns every day. So we're not downsizing. We're upsizing, especially if you look at my tummy, I'm really upsizing, getting fat. <laughs> but the reason is that there's, you're giving people something they want, something they need. And that's what has to happen in your business. To be innovative, to be sensitive. Now that sensitivity in business has to be not just to your clients, it has to be to your suppliers. It has to be to your fellow workers. And this is the first thing I'm going to point out here. That sensitivity, which will be your competitive edge, is developed through these teachings, psychologi psychological teachings of Buddhism, and especially through the practice of a little bit of meditation. Because one of the essential parts of meditation is called mindfulness, like awareness, the ability to listen to actually to gather the information from the moment and be more perceptive than other people. To understand what this mindfulness is, I call it total listening. Total listening is when someone's speaking and your mind is empty. You're fully alert, you're not looking at the floor, you're not thinking about something else. You're fully with what's happening. We train this in meditation called present moment awareness and silence. Which means when someone's talking, when they're there in front of you, you're not just listening to their words, you pick up their body language as well. And even you get so sensitive, even smells and other things, you pick up where they're coming from. And that total listening means you put everything into this moment, what that person in front of you, you just listen with everything you've got. And it's amazing what you can pick up when you have that degree of mindfulness, full attention to the moment. With a client, sometimes you can pick up that you're not getting the message through. They're not interested in how you're presenting your product. And if you're that mindful and alert, you pick these things up quickly and you can change. For those of you who have listened to me giving many talks, you may notice, number one, I never plan what I'm going to say. And number two, when I give a talk, I always look at you, scanning my audience. Because I will change the talk if I see too many people looking at their watch. <laughs> I'm sensitive to what's going on. And that's why you can keep people engaged. And you can adjust your product to fit your clients. Too often, that people are just stuck. They've got their plans, they've got their how they're going to present things, they're not innovative, and because they're not innovative, they're not alert, they're not paying attention, they miss too many deals. First story I'm going to tell, I'm not sure, I think I told this to the retreatants, but I haven't told this in, in the public talk, is uh, one of my disciples in Sydney, Julie. Did I tell this talk on the, the first evening? Who was, um, went all the way to London to do a deal in fashion? Okay, I'm going to tell it again anyway. <laughs> There's one of my disciples in Sydney. She's built up her business in the fashion industry, supplying to many, many big stores throughout Australia. And she told me on one occasion she was going all the way from Sydney to London to finalize a deal, a very lucrative deal for her company. And when she got to London, she did not have time to rest. She was jet lagged, tired after, I don't know, 24, 27 hour journey. All she could do was check into her hotel, have a shower, 
and then turn up to the boardroom of this big company in London. And when she turned up into that boardroom, the other directors told her she was wasting her time. The managing director, the MD, was in such a bad, filthy mood that morning. He was shouting at everybody, he's a bad person to make a deal with anyway, but today he's in such a filthy mood, you might as well go back to your hotel and get on the next plane to Sydney. No way, they told her, will you get your deal signed today. And of course she was very crestfallen and disappointing. Having worked so hard for a deal, as many business people do, and having gone all the way from you know, Sydney to London to clinch the deal, to be told you wasted your time, was very, very depressing. But instead of getting depressed and giving up, what this girl did, this meditating Buddhist from Sydney, a Caucasian, she was born in London, she sat in the corner of the boardroom and just meditated for five minutes saying, well, I might as well see the MD anyway, even if he's going to shout at me, I might as well see him. So she sat in a corner, calmed her mind, and did the meditation on loving-kindness. Now the door of my heart is open to whatever happens, and to all beings, may all beings be happy and well. It's a classic Buddhist meditation. And what happened next surprised even her. After about five or six minutes, the MD stormed into the boardroom in a filthy mood. Who's that? Whoever you are, get out. There's no way she was going to deal signed, the directors told her. But when she stood up, she said she didn't know where these words came from. But she just looked at that managing director and said, you've got such beautiful blue eyes, like, just like my little baby Holly. And the director looked at her and said, Really? <laughs> because it came from the heart, it was unplanned, spontaneous, just coming from kindness, it melted that managing director. She had her contract signed in five minutes. And when the managing director went out of the room, she told me all the other directors just huddled around her and said, teach us that. How did you manage that? That was miraculous. How did you do that? She got her contract because she knew just how to short-circuit these negative emotions of other managing directors. There's a power which you can develop in the mind. And if we develop that power in our business, we do get competitive edges. There's a basic story which I have in my book, Open the Door of Your Heart, which I mentioned many times and which the former Premier of Western Australia also mentioned to sum up his talk about fighting depression in a big uh, uh, lecture he gave in Sydney a couple of months ago. And it's one of the fascinating stories because it's easy to understand, it goes, against, goes across all religions and it's practical advice for life. It's a story of the Emperor's Three Questions. And the reason I'm mentioning it here because one of the disciples mentioned that got them a promotion recently. Or this offer of an, a promotion. The Emperor's Three Questions goes like this. And if you're a business person, if you're a leader in a group of companies, tell your staff this. It's excellent, good advice, simple to increase your bottom line. The Emperor's Three Questions was a story which was originally told by Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian author who wrote War and Peace and many other novels. But at this particular novel was actually written in Yiddish because the Jewish community in Russia at the time were being persecuted. This was a hundred years or so ago and together with other great Russian novelists like Chekhov they wrote a series of short stories in the Hebrew language called Yiddish, published them as a fundraiser to help the Jewish community. But the story was later translated into English and it's a beautiful story called 
the emperor's three questions. To summarize the story, he told about an emperor who was fed up with religion. All these religious leaders were arguing with each other, all saying they were right and everyone else was wrong. And so he thought, I'm going to find my own religion, or like the core of all religions. So after discussing with many religious leaders and philosophers and scientists and just generally wise people, he managed to condense religion, philosophy, the meaning of life into three important questions. And those three questions were these. When is the most important time? Who is the most important person? And what is the most important thing to do? When is the most important time? Who is the most important person? And what is the most important thing to do? And most of the short story concerned the emperor's quest for the answers to those fundamental questions. So I think as you will agree, if you could answer those three questions truly, then you have all the religion and philosophy you need in life. Eventually he found the answer by accident from a small boy. However, I won't go into the details of how he found the answers, but to ask you what you think those answers are. The first question is the easiest one. When is the most important time? And the answer is always now. Now is the most important time. Unfortunately, we know that, but we keep on forgetting it. If you really love your children and care for them, spend time with them, not next week, but now. Otherwise, the time goes by and your children, they don't know their father. They hardly see their mother. And after a while, there's a separation there. They play up, they're naughty. About three years ago, in the, when I was in Singapore, in the Straits Times, there was a suicide note published from about a 12-year-old boy who'd actually jumped out one of the windows of the high HDB flats or jumped off the balcony. He killed himself. And in his suicide note, he wrote, all I ever wanted was to spend time with my mother and father. All I ever wanted was to spend time with my mother and father. Sometimes if we don't spend time now, it becomes too late. The only time to say sorry to your wife or to your husband because you shouted at them, don't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. The only time to say how much you love each other is now. The only time to say thank you to your parents, how grateful you are for what they've done for you. Don't wait for tomorrow. Now is the only time you'll ever have. When you understand the power of that now, you understand that it is the most important time, but we keep putting it off. It's a powerful answer that now is the most important time. But the next question was for me the most powerful answer because it was totally unexpected. When I read this book as a student at Cambridge University and I read that second qu the answer to the second question, I just left me spinning, seeing my whole life in a different way, especially the relationships which I had with other people. Who is the most important person? Most people, when I ask this, says oneself. That's the Western modern idea that you are the most important. And that is totally wrong. In this book, they said the most important person is the one you're with, whoever that happens to be. They are the most important person, the one right in front of you. Too often in life, when I went to see someone, and this particular time I was a student, and sometimes I would go up to these lecturers after they gave, finished their uh, discourse on physics or something, 
and I would ask them a question and they weren't listening they wanted to get rid of me I was just a small insignificant student and they had more important things to deal with has ever, that ever happened to you? you go and ask someone a question, you go and talk to them and you're not important it's a terrible feeling it's not so bad if you're a student but if that's your husband and you want to talk to them and they're not listening how do you feel? you feel like you're not important that's how marriages break down when the other person does not feel respected you're not being listened to you don't have to be agreed to for example my monastery has about 20 monks we have to make decisions communally even though I'm the abbot and the boss if I want harmony in my workforce if I want everyone going the right direction I know as a business strategy I have to listen to all of those monks even the monk who's just been ordained that day I have to listen to them, even the little novices you know why they're called novices? novice means no vice so a novice monk has, novice monk has no vice <laughs> so I have to listen to them and I know from experience as long as everyone in my community, in my workforce feels that they are listened to even if I disagree with them and go on another course of action they never object all they want to do is to have their ideas and opinions respected, listened to and put into the balance that's the same with a family, that's the same with an office how many times has it happened to you? you've given an input you know, you're really trying to make the office or make the workplace, the company run smoother and you give your input and you're not even listened to you're not important who do you think you are? they think and that makes you just despondent, you don't want to work for these people, you're not cared for and that's not good business all you really need to do, if you're any type of manager is to listen to the people listen to them properly, they're important to you, their opinion is important you don't have to agree with it but you have to listen to it and once they feel they're listened to then they usually go along with whatever you decide that's the psychology of working in a group people understand they need leaders understand that sometimes their ideas aren't going to win out but at least they're respected but it's more than that because if the person in front of you is the most important person in the world if they're your customer you are mindful, you listen they feel that you're paying attention and you can hear their needs you are customer sensitive now it's a silly thing to say or it seems to be a silly thing to say but too many businesses are not sensitive to their customers many of you may own a Dell computer you all know how Dell started out just a guy in college who brought a heap of discarded computers he just fixed them up, altered them slightly because he was sensitive to the needs of what people wanted he was that sensitive he just transfigured, transformed the computer slightly and sold them on and because of his customer service I think it was the first computer company which did 24 hour phone line any problems with your computer, troubleshooting there was somebody on the end of a phone 24 hours a day to answer your problems he started from nothing from scratch and now it's one of the biggest companies in the world simply because of sensitivity to your customers needs and those of you who are dealing with the public, with customers you're seeing them every day they're telling you what they need but 
We're not telling, we're not listening to what they need. We're just trying to sell them what we want to give them. No wonder your company doesn't do well. In that customer service, when you think that person in front of you on the end of the telephone, uh, on your showroom is the most important person in the world, it's amazing what you pick up and how you can change little things from time to time. To innovate, adjust and make your company, your business more attractive. You don't need to go out doing customer research by sending out forms and surveys and that just really bothers people. I don't know how many forms that people give me to fill out and sometimes you get fed up with filling out forms. But all the time you're listening, you're hearing, you're being with people and that's where you get your information from. But not only that, because you are care for your customer, that person in front of you realizes you are listening, you care for them because they are the most important person in the world for you and they feel that, they will come back again. In the same way that your wife, your husband, if they think that you're listening, that you care for them, they will stick with you. That's one of my problems. I've got too many monks in my monastery, they keep sticking with me. Can't get rid of them. <laughs> but that's a nice problem for being a monk. So you get a good company because the person in front of you is the most important. And it's the same if that's one of your workers. As a boss, these people who work for you, they're your left arm, your right arm. I've been away from my monastery for two weeks now. I just gave a call to my right hand monk this afternoon, how are things going on? Because there was a, something which I had to fax to him uh, a couple of days ago, he got the fax, all sorted out, He's a, a marvelous monk to have as your right hand monk. That's why I really care for that guy. Because if that guy went away or got fed up with me and thought he wasn't being cared for, I would never be able to come to Penang and give any retreats. So as a business person, you know you're a successful manager. This is an old saying in the West. You're a successful manager if you can get all of your um, underlings to do the work so you can always play golf on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> in other words, you can trust people, you can delegate and you know those people are going to do the work. And how do you do that? Because you know that your customers are important, not customers, your workers are important. Without those workers, you've got no company. So, it's not just caring for the clients, it's also caring for the other people who work with you. And this brings me on to a story which impressed the HR people in Singapore last year, or early this year, sorry, middle this year in May. Because I, somebody, people always tell, send me interesting stories which they pick up from the internet, from magazines, and this one was from an engineering journal from the UK. There was a firm which uh, won a huge prize for business innovation. It was an engineering firm called Farrelly and Sons who do building maintenance. Now these huge condos, they maintain such things as the electricity and the, the plumbing, the lifts, all that sort of stuff. And in 12 months this company had trebled their turnover and doubled their profits which is very impressive in the business world, to double your profits in you know, 12 months and treble your turnover, you know, was impressive. But the reason why they succeeded, that was why they got the prize. They had a very simple business strategy. All they did was to ban overtime. <laughs> They stopped all overtime in their firm. So, whether it was a CEO, whether it was a manager, a vice president or just a janitor, after eight hours they had to go home. And they couldn't take their work back home with them. They had to leave it in the office. And as a result of that, their turnover trebled, profits doubled and the other thing which I didn't say, their staff turnover went to zero. Because you know what happens in the business? When people get burnt out or fed up or negative, they will leave. 
they will resign and go somewhere else. And what happens when a good employee or manager has to leave? With them goes all of their contacts, with them goes all of their experience, and you have to go and hire someone else and train them all again. It's really bad for business, having to keep on having your workers leave and then hire new ones. Even in my business, if my senior monks leave and I've got to train another one, oh that takes so long. So by banning overtime, all the workers in this company, they realized the management actually cared for them. They wanted to work in such a nice company that no one wanted to leave. Number two, as many of you should know, if you are at all sensitive to your mind, that after a certain number of hours at work, you become very unproductive. If you spend too many hours in front of a computer screen, your mind gets so soft and dull and stupid, you make many, many mistakes. You only have a certain amount of time when you're efficient, and you push it too much, your efficiency goes down, 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 down. Basically you're wasting time. And a lot of times you can make big mistakes because you're too tired. In business, if it's a competitive business, you've got to be sharp. You've got to be really on top of your game. You can't afford to make a mistake. That's why you should not work too long hours. It's bad for you. You are not producing good work. You all know that. So they stop that process, that uh, usual uh, habit of thinking that more hours means you get more work done. It's efficiency is the word, not the length of hours worked. So they stopped that and the efficiency of the staff went up, their productivity went up, they stayed on the job and it's also the other thing called staff morale. In an office, in any workplace, in a monastery, people want to be there, they, or they need to want to be there, they have to have some motivation you know, to do the best thing for their company. And money is not a good enough motivation, because you can get a better salary maybe next door in another office. So one of the best motivations to work for your company, in this work with Farrelly and Sons, which is to know that this is a nice place to work, people cared for you, and so actually people worked harder. They had more incentive to keep that good company going. So I don't think you need to be a psychologist or a genius to understand how that strategy worked. By banning overtime, they got more work done, more efficiently, better staff morale, no turnover, everyone was more sensitive to their clients and to themselves, not so much office politics, which always comes because people are stressed out and tired. More harmony, more working together, which meant more profits. The company got a prize for such innovation. So it goes against what some people think you should do to actually to survive in the modern business world. It's not just hard work and willpower, it's like wisdom power. That's what I keep on telling meditators, don't keep trying to get enlightened. You don't get there by willpower, you get there by wisdom power. Be sensitive, understand what's going on. So the second question, the person you're with is the most important person. And the last thing, the most important thing to do is to care. To be caring and to be careful. That is marvelous advice for any company. And instead of taking all of your workers to one of these seminars in a big hotel in KL where you get some guru from the United States charging you $10,000 for a weekend. You can come to Mahindarama temple on a Wednesday night and get all this for free. And it's better. So this is how you can teach your staff. And it works. Some years ago, I was on one of the domestic aircrafts uh, in Thailand 
And in the aircraft, we've got nothing to do, so I was reading a copy of the Bangkok Post. And one of the feature articles there was on the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok. Because the Oriental Hotel is one of the oldest hotels, six star, and on that year it had won the international prize for the best hotel in the world. Now that's a very prestigious prize to win. In the whole world that was voted by the people who know as the top hotel. And so the Bangkok Post was doing an interview with the manager to find out what your secret is. How did you get that top prize for your hotel? What was your business strategy? You know what he said? He said, every year I send all of my staff from the management up to down to the cleaners for one week at a Buddhist monastery at the, <laughs> at the company's expense. It's not taken off your holidays or paid for by the hotel. You're sent to learn a bit of meditation and a bit of Buddhist philosophy. And he said that was the main reason why his hotel had got the top prize. <laughs> now that was fascinating. That was in Thailand, so I'd expect send them to Buddhist monastery. But when they asked him what's going on there, he said, look, in the hotel industry, it's customer relations. Hospitality is the most important. That's what makes the company thrive. You're with these tourists, these business people, who are coming off long flights, who are stressed out, or who just want to have a happy, peaceful time. And it's the attitude of the doorman, the cleaner, the person who does the, the, the housework. These are the people who make the hotel experience a positive one for all the visitors, the ones who pay. And if a person is stressed out, they're not going to be so accommodating to some of these tourists who keep asking for all sorts of ridiculous things. But if you're rested, at peace, you've got a good mind, you're far more charming. And charm goes a long way in any business to get your contract, to get the things supplied. It's all this contact. What Daniel Goldman called emotional intelligence networking, friendliness, being able to contact and connect with people. He's noted was the secret to success in life. That's why his book Emotional Intelligence became the bestseller. Simply because it's not just hard work and willpower. It's not even just you know, uh, mental intelligence, getting your big degrees from university. It's how to make use of all of the, the resources, the people, the friends, your business colleagues, and of course anyone in business knows it's your contacts, above all, bring you success. It's how you can network, get your supplies, get things quickly, get things on time, supply this, and that's where you make your money in business. And if you haven't got those emotional contacts, because you're a grumpy, negative person, you haven't rested and trained your mind in a bit of kindness, you're going to lose a lot of business. People want to do business with their friends, with people who care for them, with people who they feel some sort of emotional connection for. Just like that lady Julie who went to that MD when he said, you've got such beautiful blue eyes like my baby Holly. Straight away the connection was made. A little bit of friendship and warmth. He wanted to do a contract with such a person. And he got, she got the contract. Don't underestimate this. And that manager of the hotel in, Oriental Hotel in Bangkok realized that he wanted to make his staff de-stress get sensitive to their clients, a little bit of emotional intelligence, learned from the monastery, a more mindfulness, and he said that was a key to his success. So, all of you people who own businesses here, 
you should send all of your workers to the next retreat by Ajahn Brahm in Mahindrama Temple this time next year. <laughs> At your expense. <laughs> These things work. But it's not just the contacts we make and how we work with our people. The other thing which I wanted to mention on business success is innovation. And you all know the business mantra, innovate or perish. If you've got your little niche, you're selling some product and it's working, you're getting a bit of a, prod, a, a profit, someone else is going to come up and take over your market. You'll do it slightly cheaper, slightly better and you're lost. You should never just take things for granted and take it too easy in business. Always innovating, always changing. And to innovate, again you need that sensitivity. The new ideas, the breakthroughs, especially in R&D, research and development, always come from peaceful, quiet minds. You have to be creative. And the way the mind works, we always go in the same channel. We are conditioned, we are like like horses, always trained to go around the same circuit in the same way. And to be innovative, to do things no one else has done, to see opportunities which no one else sees, we have to break that old conditioning. And the only way to break that old conditioning is the training in meditation called mindfulness, stillness. When I was at Cambridge, just after I left, there's one of the students called Johansson, uh, no, no, not Johansson, it's Stephen, ah, I forgot his name now. I think it was uh, Johnson, Josephson, sorry, Josephson. Josephson, who uh, invented what we call in computer technology the Josephson Junction. The Josephson Junction is like a semiconductor but which operates, which works at close to absolute zero. So to have a supercomputer run at close to absolute zero temperatures. Because at such temperatures we get the phenomenon called superconductivity where the electri electricity just flows almost immediately. And therefore you cut the time down. Computations get done in no time at all. And he needed some, some semiconductor mechanism which acts at that temperature, he found it out, the Josephson Junction and that opened up a whole new possibility for computers which run at, sub, at almost close to absolute zero temperatures. And he got that idea when he was meditating. He was a meditator and in the article he wrote, that's when the idea came to him. There was one of the uh, French uh, mathematicians called Fouché, he got his theories. They came to him while he was on a bus going to visit the ancient paintings in the caves of southern France. So often our ideas and solutions come when we stop thinking about them. There was one sort of executive who came on my retreat in Perth a couple of years ago. She came straight from work, even though the retreat started 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. You know what it's like sometimes if you're an executive and you're taking nine days off, you just stay at your desk and try and get as much done as possible. You don't finish it all and say, what the hell, I'm going off to the retreat. You know, without any dinner, just rushing. And she came and told me she had these big problems she had to sort of find solutions for in a few days. But what she did, because she was a trained meditator, she completely forgot about them, left them alone and didn't even think about them and carried on with her quiet meditation. Four or five days later she came into one of the interviews and she said, it's amazing, just I was sitting in there meditation and, and these ideas, the solutions, the problems came up to me. And she said, they're brilliant solutions, it's, you couldn't have thought about them, it's obvious now. But she would never have been able to figure it out by thinking. They only came to her in the silence of the mind. And when she went back to work, 
she put those solutions into uh, in the process and they were very, very effective. In business you have to find solutions to problems as they come up from day to day. But what do people do? Think, 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 think. And if that doesn't work, they think, 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 think. And they keep on thinking so much they get stressed out, sometimes they get crazy and they can't see the good solutions. Innovation, as far as I know from the science of the mind called meditation, only comes when you're absolutely still. Because in that stillness you've broken the habits. You're not seeing things in the same old ways. You can have different ways of looking, new innovative ways. Which is why if you teach people meditation, especially if you teach that to your kids at school, quiet time, silent time, they will become much more resourceful, innovative and they will be the people who make the breakthroughs which create new businesses, new opportunities, new products. Take for example the great Steve Jobs, the guy who invented Apple Macintosh, or just Apple at first, in his backyard. This last year, oh, not last year, I think it was in last, uh, yeah it must have been I think, no, 2004 I think. In 2004, in the summer of 2004, Steve Jobs gave the graduation address at Stanford University. It was a classic address which went around the internet. If you haven't seen it, look at it, read it. It's brilliant and so inspirational. Because Steve Jobs was an orphan. He was adopted by some very kind parents who really looked after him, gave him a good education and sent him to college. You all know how much college costs in the United States he wasn't happy with the subjects which he was doing at college. And so he made a decision, a tough decision to make, to drop out, to not continue with his degree. The only class he did continue with, because he enjoyed it, was calligraphy. And when he decided to carry on, because his parents had paid for the, the year, when he decided to carry on just with calligraphy, he thought, quite guiltily, this is fun, but how can you get an employment in the United States for calligraphy? But he enjoyed it. Later on, when he started Apple Computer and the famous Apple II, one of the reasons why it was successful, one of the reasons was because of its beautiful font. And he said, you owe today the beautiful font on your computers and the different types of font to Steve Jobs dropping out of college and spending all his time studying calligraphy. At the time you don't realize what you're doing. You think that your passion will never give rise to any business opportunities but what he was saying was, no, follow your passion. Because when you're passionate about something, you give it energy, you'll be innovative, and my goodness, you can turn the most unpromising of fields into something which will, for him, made his company a fortune. But he continued with his address, telling that when the Apple computer started to lose business, mostly I think to the IBM P PC, he got the sack. He got thrown out of the company he founded. Imagine that, you started a company and the board throws you out. And there he was, just I think in his late twenties, without a job, a has-been. Obviously he had lots of money, so it wasn't short of a, you know, a few dollars, but no future, nothing to do. He said he got depressed for the first week or two, but then he thought, what do I like doing? He was always computing. So he got back on the computer board, and within a few weeks he started two more companies. The lesser of the companies is now called Pixar. You know Pixar company? 
Another multi-billion dollar multinational company. This is a guy who you can't stop. If he starts one company and they throw him out, he just starts another multi-billion dollar company. And his other company also did very well and it got so well that Apple or now Macintosh decided they had to take it over and one of the deals with taking over his second company was to re-employ Steve Jobs. <laughs> so he got back into Apple Macintosh again by starting two new companies. And he said afterwards, he said to the people in Stanford, he said, always follow your passion. And he said, stay hungry. Stay hungry meant never get so self-satisfied in your company. You think everything's going fine and well, I never need to do anything else, it's all okay now, I don't need to innovate. He said that's what the problem was with many companies. Life is going well, you think, oh you've got it all sorted out now, and you think the dollars are going to just roll in. Or like me, I'm a teacher, I teach good Dhamma, people will keep coming again and again and again. If I keep telling the same stories and the same jokes on the same talks, after a while you won't come anymore. I've got to keep on finding new stories, or new ways of teaching, or new subjects. If I don't innova innovate, will you come back? Now you just get, go and get the old CDs, or the old sort of <laughs> talks which you've heard before, why come here? So if you innovate, and you adjust, your business becomes very successful. But the other thing in Steve Jobs' address is your passion. For me, my passion is meditation. That's what I really love doing. I don't just talk about this. When I'm in my monastery, that's all I end up doing, sitting in my hut all day. So that's my passion. That's why when I teach meditation, I can teach with energy, with care. It's also my passion is that Buddhism and teaching these amazing, what well, I found very, very useful teachings. Because I'm passionate when I teach, that's what gives it an edge. The worst thing you can do is come to a temple and listen to a monk droning on again and again and again and again, just so boring. Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? When you give it passion, it gives it life. When it gives it passion, it gives it energy, when it's got energy and life, you get some progress, you get people coming along with you. And so that Steve Jobs was saying in industry, have that passion for what you're doing. And if you have that passion, that innovation, you're going to be a leader. A leader which brings other people along with them. And if you are going to have some sort of merger or buy a company or make it sort of stronger, it's that passion which impresses other people. Here's a guy who believes in their product. Any salesperson has to believe in what they're selling. You have to believe it deep inside and be passionate about it. If I didn't believe that what I was teaching here was going to help you and make you happier people, solve some of the problems in your companies, in your business, in your life. I just couldn't do this. And you'd actually sense that you know, he was saying this but he didn't really mean it. When you put passion into what you're doing, because you really believe it and you're sincere, you carry many people along with you. Even my retreat centre project, I'm passionate about that, I believe it's going to work, it's going to be a great thing for, for many people from Malaysia and Singapore and Australia obviously and other places of the world who are already coming to Perth to learn meditation. And I'm passionate about that, therefore I'm confident about it and it brings people along. That's why it becomes a successful project. So there's much to learn about how to be a Buddhist and how to be a successful Bud businessman. And it's not that Buddhism says you should all be poor like a monk. And that if you make money, that there's something wrong there, you're just craving and attached. The job with being a Buddhist is to do your very best, to put energy into what you're doing. And you know that your business is not just for yourself. Every business which people do, it benefits many people, creates employment and that employment creates a prosperity which means your children have a school and a home to go to. It's all part of this thing we call life. 
And the Buddha actually said many times, if you have your righteous earnings, they're not learned by f uh, earned by fraud or by exploiting other people, but if you earn your living righteously, then you should enjoy your, your wealth, you should enjoy whatever you earn, because you've worked for it, you've done it in the right way, you haven't stolen or cheated, good on you. But he also said that once you have that wealth, to put it into four ways, put it into your family, your personal enjoyment, and investment for the future, and the other one is charity for your community. The investment is what a lot of people don't remember. Because sometimes what happens is when you're wealthy, you think the times are always going to be like this, and you don't invest for the poor times. Stock markets go up, stock markets go down. The property goes up in price, then it goes down in price. The commodities go up, they go down. Business opportunities come and then they stagnate. Now you should know that. The economy is never going to go up, 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 up. So you have to invest for the bad times. So that when those times come, you can ride the lows. Which is why the last story I'm going to tell you, a classic Buddhist story called The Emperor's Ring. The Emperor's Ring story goes like this. There was a king a long, long time ago, a young man who took over the empire. He was a manager, but this time of a state. And every time the kingdom was prospering, you know, the prophets were going up, he would hold celebrations and parties. And because he was celebrating too much, he was not doing enough work to invest for the future. And so the good times never lasted very long. And when the good times went, and the times were depressed, he too got depressed, spent all his time in his room sulking and being inactive. And because of that, the bad times lasted longer than they should. Now it's very hard for the people underneath an emperor or like the people underneath a CEO to give advice. Because CEOs, bosses, managers, kings, abbots, <laughs> they're all a bit proud. So the ministers had to be innovative. All they did was order a ring, a gold ring from the local goldsmiths. And the ring was an ordinary gold ring except for one thing. On the outside of that ring was engraved the words, this too will pass. This too will pass. And they told the young emperor, wear this ring on all occasions, which he did. And he'd often look at the ring. When it was bad times, when the economy was down, he kept on looking at the ring. This too will pass, this too will pass. So he never got too depressed or too despondent, which meant he kept on working. Even though it looked a bit difficult, he knew that situations change, opportunities change, so he never gave up. Because he never gave up, he rode through the bad times, and in his kingdom, the good times, didn't last as long as they used to, simply because he was always proactive. He never gave up or got depressed when things were bad. And when things went well in the kingdom, he did not take them for granted. He still looked at the ring. This too will pass, this too will pass. So he didn't think his profitable company would last that long. And so he was always working hard investing in the future, even though it looked like he was already profitable enough. He knew it, would, it would, wouldn't last, things change. So when you have prosperity, don't take it for granted, thinking it's always going to be this way. This too will pass, this too will pass. And in that kingdom, the prosperous times lasted longer than they ever had before. And that was the trick of the emperor's ring which kept that emperor one of the most popular kings and rulers of that empire, simply because 
the Emperor's ring of this too will pass, taught him how to never give up in bad times and how to invest in the future during good times. So these are not just business strategies, these are strategies for life coming from ancient Buddhist teachings, learning how that you can be a good Buddhist, in fact a very good Buddhist, a wise Buddhist, and these teachings go down into the office and the boardroom and they make you more successful. They are useful, not to your religious life. You don't just go to the temple when you get married and when you die, and on Waisak day. You go to the temple to learn how to have a happier marriage, a deeper understanding of science, and also a more successful business life. That's how to be a Buddhist and to be a successful business person. Thank you for listening. Okay, so that's a different talk than you've heard before because I've been innovating again on a different subject. So has anyone got any questions from the floor they'd like to ask? Any questions from the floor they'd like to ask about what I've just been saying? Obviously it does make sense to a lot of people because I have to go to businesses now and teach them how to run their companies. <laughs> okay, here we go for the first question. Some of these questions have been written before and they're on general Buddhist ideas. So um, it's not all on the subject of this evening. Dear Ajahn, in Chinese culture there are twelve animal signs. In our zodiac, I have a friend who mother, whose mother wants her to break off with her boyfriend because their animal signs are not compatible. <laughs> her mother said so after consulting a medium. What is the Buddhist point of view regarding compatibility of married marriage according to zodiac signs? Okay, the zodiac signs will give only a very general, general, general sort of idea of person's character. But it's so general that you can always sort of adapt and change to what you have to, to deal with. So the most important thing is that two of you love each other, respect each other, care for each other, and that way there's no two people who can't live together in peace and happiness. And I know this from experience, sometimes I've looked at two people who are about to get married and I think, my goodness, you two are not going to make it at all. <laughs> Complete opposites. And despite me, they've had some happy marriages. Really you can't predict you know, what a marriage is going to turn out like. No one can. But what I can predict is if you work at it, and if you're skillful, if you're wise, you can turn any marriage into a beautiful partnership. So basically, you know what mothers-in-law are like. <laughs> sometimes they say this and they say that. They're well-meaning but sometimes they don't know what they're talking about. So I would actually say that if you really think that you love each other and you care for each other and you've got some things in common, then go for it, go and get married. So the zodiac signs are only just one ingredient and it's only a small ingredient. Other things are much more important. So if you want to bring your mother-in-law to me or your mother and I'll explain it to her. Because <laughs> sometimes they won't listen to you but they listen to monks. Hi Ajahn, if a company stops stops overtime but still demands the same output productivity even though efficiency has reached the max, close to 100%. How to deal with this? You're talking about the family and sons. Okay, you know, a lot of times when you pay overtime, so when you have overtime you have to pay overtime and it's usually you know, a lot of money and you're not getting the best hours of a person's productive week. So if you have to pay overtime, number one, you're not getting value for money. It's probably better to employ another worker. Number two is if you try and get more work out of a person 
which is paying them the same amount of money for the same amount of time again. They don't want to work for you. And the thing is, it's the efficiency. Sometimes so they make one or two mistakes, because when they're very, very tired, and those mistakes take days, weeks to rectify. It's the mistakes which people make, which you have to go back on and fix up. That's what takes so much time and costs so much money. So don't think that productivity is just hours working. It's efficiency, which means you've done some work and it's high quality, error free work. It's getting the errors out of the system. How much time does it cost when you've got a product and you've got to fix it up afterwards? Or you've got a house and there's something which is wrong with the house or the apartment and you've got to get all these people to fix it up. And how much cheaper is it, is it when you fix it up at the first time it was done right from the very beginning? This is what we mean by efficiency, getting it right. And that was in the Journal of Engineering, it must have been 2002 or something. I can check it out for you later on if you want to. You can check it out for yourself. This firm won the prize, that's what it did, banned overtime and efficiency went up. And it more than compensated for the lack of hours people were doing the number of hours saved on mistakes, frustration, office politics. Because look, it's one of those things which I know, because I'm a monk, the tireder you are, the more grumpy and angry you are. It's just a law of nature. If you're stressed out, not only do you make mistakes, but you shout at other people, you have this terrible office politics, and this office politics, backstabbing, argument and stuff, that costs a lot of money. I'm just talking about economic terms, let alone families, health, well-being. Because when you get really upset, you take it out on your loved ones, your health suffers, sometimes you need to see therapists and psychologists to get you back to work again, because of the traumatic experiences you have in your offices. So many people keep telling me about office politics and just how terrible it is. And it's not just psycho psychological problems, this stops your, the GDP of the, com the, the country. This has an effect on your productivity. Spend so much time worrying about you know, people behind your back, who's going to get a promotion, instead of time working for your company. That's how it works. Divan Ajahn, this is a Buddhist question. In Upanishad Sutta, the Buddha mentioned the approximate cause for the arising of faith is suffering. Can Ajahn kindly explain in details? The suffering in your company, now you've heard me talk about it, it should give you faith in Buddhism. In other words, these Buddhist teachings actually address the problems of life called suffering. And by addressing the problems of life, you see the problems of life addressed squarely then that gives you confidence that this path is worth following and investigating further. Which is why the Buddha called, from the understanding of suffering, it gives rise to the faith in these teachings. Now, Buddhism is a problem-solving religion. The Mahayanis Su Chi movement, found in Taiwan, seen in propaganda video, has accused Theravadans of overemphasizing introspection in a hut, meaning excessively meditating all the time, as opposed to di rendering direct hands on help to the needy, uh, would as they do. This claim is the essence of Buddhism. Your comment, please. Okay, the, there is a lot to be. Uh, sometimes people win a lot of converts by putting down other people. It's called the way of negativity. Say, all oh, the other people, they're not like us. They do this wrong, they do that wrong. And putting down other people, that negativity, is something which I just really detest. So I try never to do that. In all the talks I've given here, have you ever heard me putting down any religion or any part of Buddhism? I'm a Theravada forest monk, but I don't go around putting down others. And this is actually an early Buddhist monarch called the Emperor Asoka. 
wrote on a stone pillar which is still here today and thing in some museum in India. This was an emperor of India 2,300 years ago, a devout Buddhist who says that anyone who criticizes another person's faith thereby uh, diminishes his own religion. Just by criticizing another person's faith you're diminishing your own religion. In other words, by criticizing others you know, you're lessening, you know, your authority. Because there's so much inter-religious criticism and also inter, inter-religion criticism. There's an old story, it's a joke, about this man in the United States who was walking home one evening and saw a man on a bridge on the other side of the railing about to jump off to commit suicide. And the man said, don't, don't jump, don't jump. And the man about to commit suicide, don't stop me, don't stop me, if you come any nearer I'll jump. And the man said, what religion are you? And the man about to jump, I'm a Christian. And the guy said, I'm a Christian too, let's talk about this. What type of Christian are you, a Protestant or Catholic? And the man about to jump said, I'm a Protestant. So am I, I'm a Protestant too. Look, we're friends, don't jump. What denomination of uh, Protestant? He said, I'm a Baptist. Amazing, said the fellow trying to save his life. I'm a Baptist too. Now don't jump, we're friends. What type of baptism? He said, Southern Baptist. This is an amazing coincidence. I'm a Southern Baptist too. Look, we're friends, don't jump. What type of Southern Baptist? 1915 reformed, said the guy on the bridge. 1915 reformed, you heretic, jump! Because <laughs> he was the opposite type of Baptist. <laughs> and you find in your same religion, the closer you are, very often the more you argue with each other. So you actually find that Protestants, Baptists, they argue more with each other because they're slightly different than they argue with others. Look at the Sunnis and Shias. The closer we are, the more we argue. Now, that's one of the terrible things about religion. And sometimes there's too much, whether it's Mahayana, Theravada, Hinayana, or whatever yana, arguing with each other. And that's not Buddhism. That's not religion. We should never put each other down. And also, people who put each other down, they don't know the full story. Because what is it? They say Theravadans overemphasizing introspection in the hut, meaning excessively meditating all the time as, a, as opposed to rendering direct hands-on help. What do I do all my life? Gee, I go around helping so many people. Is, it, is this not hands-on help? Coming to Penang, after I leave here, Singapore tomorrow night for another talk, then back to Perth for another talk, on the 13th I'm back to here to, to uh, Malaysia again. On the 26th it's to, sing, to um, Sri Lanka to give a series of talks. And I come back for about a week. Then it's to Indonesia uh, in the middle of February to give some talks. Sydney in the beginning of March. Hong Kong in the middle of, at the end of March. In April it's over to England to teach this uh, seminar. And then in May over to Melbourne. Middle of May to Thailand. End of May, where am I going? I'm going somewhere in the end of May, I forget now. <laughs> so I'm one of these Theravadan monks who spends all the time introspecting in their hut. So the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. The point is that that's the idea people have that, say, Theravada monks, they just sit in their hut meditating all the time. That might be an idea, but that's not true. They may have the idea that Mahayana monks spend all their time working, but that's not true. In many temples, Mahayana monks spend a lot of time sleeping. <laughs> but they also spend a lot of time meditating as well. Just too often, we actually buy these old ideas instead of questioning them. And so, who are the compassionate ones? Who are the meditators? 
Basically, it doesn't really matter, you're Mahayana, Vajrayana, Theravada, who cares? Within each of those religions there are some selfish ones, some hard workers. And it's not a criticism of Theravada, it's not a criticism of Mahayana, it's not a cri criticism of Christianity, Islam, Hinduism or whatever. Within every religion there are the compassionate, hard workers, the wise people who really create lots of goodness for the world and lots of peace and harmony and there's other ones who create problems. So don't judge a person because of their colour, their race, their gender, their religion. You judge a person by what they're doing. So to say that Theravadas are no good, or Mahayanas are no good, or Christians are no good, or Muslims are no good, that's not right understanding. So that's my answer to that one. A lot of old rubbish. If animals can reincarnate as human beings, why is it we can eat meat and not be vegetarian instead? The consciousness of animals can linger around their bodies too. Not usually, because once an animal dies, there's very rarely any ghost animals. Has anyone seen a ghost animal? <laughs> they do have ghost animals though. I'll tell you a lovely story about a ghost dog in Perth. There's one of the disciples, she was, I'm not sure if she was uh, single or her, her husband died, but anyway, she lived alone and for companionship she had a nice dog. And you know that dogs can be such wonderful, faithful companions and she loved that dog and that dog loved her. And they would spend lots of time together and she would take the dog for a walk in a patch of forest close to her house, every day, twice a day. One day, on a walk, she lost a finger ring. The finger ring was moderately expensive, but what was really important, it had some sentimental value to her. She actually never told me why, but you know, it was such a meaningful ring to her that she spent hours retracing her steps in the forest trying to find her finger ring. But you know, a ring lost in a forest full of twigs and leaves, it's just impossible to find. She tried and tried and tried, but eventually she had to give up. And she really felt so sad that she'd lost her ring. You know what it's like when you lose something which is important to you? And you try and find it, you can't, you feel terrible. A couple of days later her dog died. And so she forgot about her finger ring because she was mourning the death of her beautiful dog. So she buried it, but she swears for the next three or four days, she heard her dog barking throughout her house. Now, if you've lived with a dog for a long time, you know the sound of your dog's bark. It's not the same as other dogs. And you know, that's my dog, no one else. And she swore she heard the sound of the dog, but she could never see it. She wanted to see a dog, even though it was dead and a ghost. All she could do was hear it. And one day, she heard her dog barking clearly outside her front door. She was close by so she quickly opened it trying to catch a glance of her dog. But she never saw the dog. What she did see, in the middle of the welcome mat in front of her door, right in the middle, was a ring. Her finger ring. Her dog, as a ghost, had found her finger ring and brought it back to his master or his mistress. And that's a true story, the ghost dog who found the lost fingering of this disciple of mine in Perth. It's a beautiful story. So ghosts can be very helpful. They can find, they can find things you lost. <laughs> How can a businessman behave in a Buddhistic manner, Buddhist manner in which a highly corrupt in a society which is highly corrupt and dishonest. It's because society is corrupt and dishonest that your honesty, your lack of corruption is your competitive advantage. This story, I forgot to mention it, a disciple in Sydney was doing a multi-million dollar deal with some Taiwanese business people. And they did it over you know, SMS, emails, sending people backwards and forwards. 
but the time came for a meeting to finalize a contract. So the Taiwanese came to Sydney, they had the meeting in the office, they got the last details of the contract, agreed, and so they said, okay, we're ready to sign. Now, a multi-million dollar contract. And the Taiwanese said, we'll sign tonight in the bar, you will provide the alcohol, and afterwards you will take us to a Sydney brothel and pay for the prostitutes. And the man said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. He said, I'm a Buddhist who keeps the five precepts. I have a wife, I'm faithful to her, I don't want to go with prostitutes. And also I don't drink. And the Taiwanese said, this is our requirements, this is the custom, you've got to entertain us, do it. He said, no, if you don't do this, take us to the bar, give us alcohol and supply the prostitutes, then no contract. So it's a multi-million dollar contract. So he said, okay, no. <laughs> and so he said, okay, deal's off. So I was very proud of that disciple. He was losing a huge contract because he wanted to keep his precepts and not be corrupt. This is another of those true stories. He told me, at home, he's quite disappointed after all that work, losing this big contract for his company. <laughs> Late that night at work, he received a telephone call from the Taiwanese businessman. They were at the bar by themselves. They'd been talking and they said, you know, we'd just been figuring out we'd rather sign a contract with someone we can trust. Someone who refuses to, to cheat on his wife probably will not cheat on us. <laughs> We're coming over to your house. Are you still up? We want to sign the contract. So they signed the contract. And it made so much sense. If you were signing a contract with someone, who would you prefer to do the deal with? Someone who is corrupt and dishonest? Or someone who knows, will say, keep five precepts? What makes business sense? It's obvious, if you have a reputation for honesty and not being corrupt, people will want to do business with you. They can trust you. So sure, much of the business world is dishonest and corrupt, but if you don't go along that way, but are honest and incorruptible, trustworthy, that becomes your competitive edge over your competitors. That will get you the contracts. So, that's what my advice and it works. Dear Ajahn, both, oops, both parents of my close friend are very, very ill. His mother is a vegetable suffering from urinary tract infections more than two years ago. His father has been diagnosed having cancer of both of his lungs, uh, which could not be operated on two months ago. What should my friend do? Is there any suited to chant for the sick? Please advise, as a close friend of his, what can I do to help? Thank you, Sadhu. Okay, when a person is that sick, one of the best things to do is not try and chant to make them get better, but give them permission to die. In other words, a lot of times that people keep alive because they're trying so hard not to die. And there's nothing wrong with dying. If you have an old body which is sick and broken down, it's much better to let it go. If you've got an old car, what do you usually do? You give it in and get a better model. A newer model with more features, maybe GPS, a better aircon. <laughs> and if you've saved your money or if you've got a good insurance policy, then obviously your next car will be a better model. By that we mean if you've done lots of good karma, you've kept up your premiums with your local temple by making lots of good karma, it means your next model will be a much better model than you've got now. <laughs>
So why not trade it in? <laughs> now, the, an interesting thing is, is though, that many people are afraid to die and because of that they don't let themselves go according to nature. They struggle to the very end and that's very painful to see. Or they try all sorts of expensive and unlikely medical procedures just in case. Instead of just saying, the chances of that medical procedure succeeding are so low, it's a waste of money, a waste of time. You know, I've had a good life. I've done my duties to my family, to my friends, especially if you're old. Now's the time to go. So go gracefully, go in style, go peacefully. <laughs> Instead of you know, saying no, 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 right to the very end. Which is why again, the people who actually follow religions like Buddhism, if they understand what life and death is, they're not so afraid to die. So you can give your parents permission to die. Saying it's okay to die. Don't try so hard to stay alive for us. You know, you've done all your duties as a parent and we love you so much. And the greatest expression of a person's love for another is their willingness to let them go. You're not thinking of yourself, you want them to be free. So, see if you can encourage them to let go. To give them permission to die. To say, I love you so much. I free you. May you be free. Dear Ajahn, what, in your, what is your advice to university graduates when they need to go out for the first time to look for a job? Okay, look, be smart. In other words, you know, sort of find out, do some research, the company, what their policies, just get on the internet and find out just you know, what the CEO likes or whatever. You know, if you find that the, the person interviewing you is a Christian, you don't wear your Buddha pendants. <laughs> <laughs> or the other way around or whatever. You know, be smart. And you do your research and the other thing which is really important and some CEOs have told me this, what they're looking for in the person who comes to the interview is like confidence. The, the university degree, what grade do you get, that's really unimportant. Because the university degree, that only says that you can pass examinations. It, doesn't, it tells you you can work hard, you can apply yourself, but it doesn't really say you know what the job is. Because as you all know, in your first job, you learn about the job. You may be an engineer, but you learn more engineering when you're actually working in your job than you work to learn at the university. And so your willingness to learn, your confidence, you're willing to engage in people, with, with the people. And obviously your friendliness as well. Because people know that you have to work with others. And the last thing any manager wants is actually to have more conflict in the office. That's the same with me when people come up to me for their interview as a monk. They want to you know, renounce, they want to become a monk. So they have to come and see me. And so I look at them, I don't care what, how long they've been a Buddhist or whether they can get into jhana or not yet. What I'm looking for if you know, a potential monk in my monastery is you know, they've got the emotional stability, they can get on with each other and they've got the confidence, they really want to do this. Because if they've got confidence, you know that that's the most important part of succeeding. You know, you're going to give it a try, yeah, I'm going to do this. So that's what I look for. So that's, I think, what maybe you should do when you are going for your first interview. Get your confidence up, do your bit of research and be really show your willingness. And you're, you really want the job, you're passionate about it, you really want it. And there's a good chance they might hire you. Dear Ajahn, is the Bodhisattva an Aryan? That's an interesting question. If you're talking about the Buddha before he became enlightened, I mean Siddhartha Gautama, I'm heretical here but I say yes, the chances were he was. Because many of you may have heard me say this and it's straight from the suttas. The, in the Gatikara Sutta, the Majjhima Nikaya, 
there was a, a Brahmin called Jyotipala uh, who was a friend of Gatikara in the time of the previous Buddha, Kasapa. And Gatikara was a great disciple of Kasapa. His best friend, Jyotipala, would scold, abuse, and defame Kasapa the Buddha at every opportunity had no faith in Kasapa the Buddha at all. But one day Gatikara managed to trick his best friend Jyotipala into seeing Kasapa the Buddha and as soon as Jyotipala saw Kasapa the Buddha he had faith and became a monk. And that person was our Siddhartha Gautama. It's one of the previous lives of Siddhartha Gautama mentioned in the Majjhima Nikaya and also Sangyuta Nikaya. In the time of Kasapa the Buddha, our Buddha, Gotama Buddha, was a monk under Kasapa. He was a monk under a Buddha. With all of those qualities, it seems to be very, very likely that Siddhartha Gotama, practicing as a monk with Kasapa the Buddha, would have got at least dream winning, if not once returning. And you know the all once returners, Sakadagamis, they said in the suttas are for the most part born in the Tusita realm. And where was Siddhartha Gotama before this life? In the Tusita realm. So that figures too. And when the Bodhisattva, the one who's about to become Gotama the Buddha, our Buddha Sakyamuni, when he was born, according to the legend, he took seven steps, put up his finger and said, this is my last life. How could he have said that unless he was a once returner? Knowing he had one life left, that's what a once returner is. So there is a lot of circumstantial evidence, but no absolute proof, but a lot of suggesting proof that Siddhartha Gotama was a Sakadagami when he was born. He was an Aryan. And he finished his task under the Bodhi tree and became the full Arahat. And it's got two, if so, why is the Bodhisattva not referred to as one of the four pairs of Aryans? I've met after that, I think he was. Is it possible that Siddhartha Gotama in his last rebirth was a Sakadagami? Yes, someone has heard me talk before. Yes, you've got it right, whoever asked, asked that question. But some people argue with me about that especially Burmese monks, they say, no, 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 because it says in the, in the commentaries. But one of the nice things about Buddhism, you can argue with each other. You can argue with me, you can argue with the most senior monk in the whole world. You can even argue with the Buddha in the time of the Buddha, and the Buddha would encourage that. Because without arguing, discussion, we can never actually find the truth. Dear Ajahn, if one does not write work overtime, how to meet the very tight deadlines imposed by managers. Thank you. To meet those tight deadlines, you have to be alive. That's why they call them deadlines, because they make you dead. <laughs> You're dead tired, dead fed up. So again, it is efficiency, not the hard work. And so, it's just like anything else. I've been told this, I think, last night or somewhere recently, to parents of children, I say, teach your children meditation. It's been shown by this professor of Harvard University in this last 12 months, anyone who meditates, their cortex thickens. You get more brain power. I think I mentioned that last night, more gigabytes between your ears. So because you are more brainy, if you meditate, more brainy than your peers, again, your competitive edge for your children. Teach them how to meditate, their brain expands. Literally, it's proven. So you get more brain to work with. Because you've got more brain to work with, when you do your homework, you don't have to waste so much time. So you can watch your video games afterwards. It's not one or the other, it's a win-win. Now that's with children. Now imagine that you can train your mind in that way to be more efficient. It means you do get more work done in less time. So you can meet those deadlines without working overtime because the time you do work, you are focused, efficient, clear. 
It's all about efficiency. And you do not use your mind efficiently at all. That's why you should train your mind. And you can do it for free here in Mahindrama temple the next time there's any meditation going on. That's called mental training. And it does make you sharp, alert. That's how I did well at Cambridge. I've been meditating since the time I first went to that university. And because of that, my mind was very efficient. So, train yourself, it works. Then you don't have to do overtime and you can meet all the deadlines and still have time with your children. How do... Okay, I've done that one. Here we go, a fresh question coming up. You see, I'm meeting the deadlines without working overtime. How would you explain euthanasia, a murder or giving permission to die? Euthanasia comes from the Greek word eu and thanos, which means good death. That's what it means, good death. So these days though, it means like euthanasia means that someone decides to kill themselves because they've got no quality of life. And so is it murder? It all depends on what you're doing. If it's just turning off the machines to let nature take its course, it's not murder, it's not killing, it is just allowing the process to happen without intervening. But that's different than mercy killing when you see someone in pain and you shoot them up with morphine in order to actually, to actually kill them. So it really depends what your intention is whether you are just allowing nature to take its course or you are positively intervening to shorten the life. And that's the difference there. Why do we get cheated in business? Is it our karma? Yes, it's because you cheated someone else and they're going to cheat you. It's usually the case, sometimes we think, oh it's unfair, I got cheated. But if you cheat someone else, you think you're smart. And now you've been outsmarted. Is it wrong to kill our competitors in business? And if so, what should we do to protect our interests and ensure our own success, assuming they are out to kill us? I mean, it's obviously you mean not physically killing you, unless your business is soldiering, and then <laughs> the, your competitors are out to kill you if it's soldiering. But if you just mean in a business, I mean, sometimes that competitiveness with your um, opposition sometimes that makes both of you sort of improve your game. That's why it is great having many religions competing for disciples these days. In Malaysia, there's many people competing for you, the Christians, the Muslims, Theravadas, Mahayanas, Vajrayanas, all competing you to say, come to our church or come to our temple. I think it's great having such competition, but you don't need to kill the competition. I thank the Christians, the Muslims, the Hindus, because they make me raise my game. I have to work harder because it's not so easy to maintain the Buddhist market share in Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we innovated with no Sunday school for kids, more meditation, no English speaking Dharma talks. This is why we do this. So competition is great. So we don't have to kill our competition. We have to outsmart them. Beat them at their own game. Or whatever else you say. Is actually use what they've done and say yes it's going to make us work harder and be more competitive. Because it's better for everybody. Because you know that sometimes in Malaysia a few years ago Buddhists were lazy and fat. They just do some chanting, a bit of holy water, and that's all you go to Buddhist temples for. Now they have to wake up and go back to the fundamental, the original teachings of the Buddha, which are brilliant. It's all there, a great product, but it's been too lazy, it hasn't marketed it. And we thank our competitors for forcing us to actually get to the heart of Buddhism and make it more meaningful, more relevant, and more alive. That's thanks to our competition. So we don't kill them, we thank them. Please advise about the art of living 
The Art of Living, AOL, by Sri Sri Rava Shankar, as is the enlightened one, or another self-made Sai Baba. The courses available are Meditation for Body, Mind and Spirit at, wow, 700, uh, Malaysian ringgit, 770 for four days. Wow, we have undercut the market. How much did it cost for four days here? <laughs> for free. You can't undercut the market more than that. <laughs> so, we're the cheapest and the best. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> so, I really doubt sometimes when people charge for religions or charge for meditation. Even my retreat center, which we're promoting on this series of talks here, that is going to be no charge. You go to those retreats in person, obviously you've got to pay the airfare because we don't own MAS. If I owed MAS, I would give you a big discount. <laughs> but I don't, it's MAS or Singapore Airlines or whatever else you go, Qantas. But once you get there, it's for free. If you want to leave a donation afterwards, fine, but there's no charge. The reason is because I was given all these teachings for free. I never paid Ajahn Chah to teach me. Ajahn Chah never taught, uh, paid his teachers. And there's something beautiful about religion being for free. Here it is, this is given to me, I share it with you. It's kindness. So any time, any people who start to actually um, charge for these teachings, it sounds a bit suspicious to me. Sometimes you charge actually to pay the hall rent because you hire a hall from someone else, you've got no choice there. But if it's your own facility, make it for free. And it's amazing, if you do it for free, then people are so generous because it comes from their heart, they say you're doing a service. And so then you're not obliged or psychologically forced to give donations or pay for anything. It's all done from the heart and so generosity gives you a lot of happiness. So I'm a bit suspicious when any religious teachings charge you for these things. The best thing is say, we'd give it for free, but if you want to leave a donation so we can help teach other people, then that's, that's more spiritual to me. That's my only comment. May I know where do we come from? Oh, I did this this morning, where we come from, where this universe was created. You came from your mummy's tummy. <laughs> oh, actually, these are the, I've done these questions this morning. So these were left in the box here. So, you see, because of my huge efficiency, we have finished 10 minutes early, so now I can finish work before time, 10 minutes early, that's efficiency, my business is going so smoothly and I don't have to work overtime this evening. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's give the, uh, any other questions from the floor before we finish? because I'm sure that people want to come up and ask me personally afterwards. So let's give, I'm going to give you a blessing now because this is the end of my retreat in Penang and also the three days of talks. I won't be coming back here again until the same time next year, usually in December I come back again, but in December next year for a longer visit to Penang. But now I'll give a blessing for all of you and for your families. Saba Buddha Nubawe Na Saba Dhamma Nubawe Na Saba Sangha Nubawe Na Buddha Ratanang Dhamma Ratanang Sangha Ratanang Tinang Ratananang Nubawe Na Chaturasiti Sahasa Dhamma Kanda nubawe na pitakataya nubawe na jina sawaka nubawe na sabe te roga sabe te baya sabe te antaraya sabe te upadawa Sabe te dunimita sabe te 
Awamangala wina santu ayu wada ko dana wada ko siri wada ko yasa wada ko bala wada ko wana wada ko sukha wada ko ho tu sabada dukha roga Baya vera so kasa tu tu padawa ane ka antaraya piwi na san tu chate jasa jaya si di danang la bang so ti baga yang su kang balang siri ya yu cha wan no cha bo gang wu di cha ya sa wa sa ta wa sa Cha ayu cha jiva siddhi bhavan tu te. Okay, now we do the sharing of merits. Idang me. This is to all your departed relations. Idang me nyati nang ho tu Sukita hon tu yata yo Hidam men yati nang ho tu Sukita hon tu yata yo Hidam men yati nang ho tu Sukita hon tu yata yo Sadhu, sadhu, Very good. Take care of yourselves and see you same time, same place next year. All the best. Take care. <coughs> um, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, we would like to thank uh, those of you who have really turned on the power of generosity to support um, Ajahn Brahm's uh, meditation retreat center project which is uh, which has now been named the Jana Grove we are indeed very happy to know that you have come out with your full support thank you very much and sis uh, sister Boswell. brothers and sisters in the Dharma we would like to take this opportunity to thank Ajahn despite Ajahn's busy schedule around the world which we have just heard how busy is Ajahn with the, all the schedules lined up until next year Yet Ajahn gives our Penang devotees the priority for being here and spending three days retreat, guiding us in this retreat and enlighten us with his ever witty and lively Dhamma talk. Let us say sadhu to Ajahn. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. On behalf of the yogis and devotees, we would like to thank Brother Kaur, Sister Amy Kaur and Sister Agnes, and all the organizing committee and helpers for organizing this five-star retreat for all of us. Thank you for making this Dhamma talk possible as well. A big sadhu also to all breakfast, lunch, and retreat Dana sponsors and contributors for making this five-star great retreat for all yogis. We are all very well taken care of during the past three days. A lot of hard work planning have been put in behind the scene before we reap the success of this retreat. To all brothers and sisters in the Dharma, thank you for coming. Happy New Year and then may the New Year bring more joy, peace, happiness, compassion, loving kindness to you and your family. <laughs>